Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Cabot Science Library, I am very pleased to welcome you to our program tonight with Dr. S. James Gates, discussing his latest book, Proving Einstein Right, The Daring Expeditions That Changed How We Look at the Universe, co-authored by Kathy Pelletier, and tonight, Dr. Gates will be in conversation with his daughter, Delilah Gates. Kathy is unfortunately no longer able to join us for tonight's event, but we are delighted to have Delilah here with us this evening instead. And in just a moment, I will turn things over to her. But first, I'd just like to say a little bit about this series and what other exciting events we have coming up this season. The Science Book Talk series features talks throughout the academic year by the authors of recently published books on a wide variety of science-related topics. Some of you may have joined us for our talk just this last week with theoretical physicist Sean Carroll. We are now gearing up for several back-to-back -back weeks of talks featuring Karen Olson on November 7th, who will discuss her new book, The Vey Conjectures on Math and the Pursuit of the Unknown. On November 13th, Lee Smolin will discuss Einstein's unfinished revolution, the search for what lies beyond the quantum. And on November 19th, Naomi Oreskes will discuss her new book, Why Trust Science. To learn more about this series or to learn about the bookstore's other upcoming events, you can visit us at harvard.com and sign up for our weekly email newsletter. Tonight's talk is going to be followed by some time for your questions, after which we're going to have a book signing and refreshments in the library just across the Science Center entryway. Uh, and if you haven't picked one up already, we will have copies of Proving Einstein Right for sale in the back of the hall and in the library as well. And as always, I just want to say thank you for buying books from Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases support this author series, and they really do ensure the future of a local independent bookstore. So thank you. And lastly, just one reminder to silence your cell phones before the talk begins this evening. So now I'm very excited to introduce Delilah Gates. Delilah is a fifth year Harvard University physics graduate student and National Science Foundation graduate research fellow studying high spin, black holes, and gravity, primarily focused on predicting observational signals black holes for the Event Horizon Telescope. Before coming to Harvard, Delilah graduated from the University of Maryland College Park as a Banneker Key Scholar, earning two bachelors of science, one in physics and one in mathematics. We are so pleased to have her here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Delilah Gates. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for being here tonight. I'm so happy to introduce to you all my father, my father, Sylvester James Gates Jr., or Jim, as he likes to be known, is a theoretical physicist known for his work on supersymmetry, supergravity, and string theory. Uh, in 2017, he retired from the University of Maryland after teaching there for over 30 years and is now at Brown University, where he is the Theoretical Physics Center Director, a Ford Foundation Professor of Physics, an affiliate of Mathematics Professor, and a faculty fellow at the Watson Institute for International Studies and Public Affairs. Before uh, getting his start as a physicist, he trained here locally. He earned two bachelor's degrees in 1973 from MIT, followed by a PhD in 1977. His doctoral thesis was the first one on supersymmetry at MIT. Then he joined the Harvard Society of Fellows in 1977 before moving on to his second postdoc at Caltech. And since then, he's been very, very busy. Uh, <laughs> he is a past president of the National Society of Black Physicists. Uh, um, he is a fellow there now, as, long, as well as a fellow at, with the American Physical Society, the American Association of Advancement for, uh, of Science, the Institute of Physics in the UK, He's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. And in 2013, he was elected the National Academy, to the National Academy of Science, becoming the first African-American theoretical physicist to do so in the societies, in the uh, history, the 150 years history of the organization. Uh, and in 2018, he was elected to serve as the vice president of the American Physical Society. 
In addition to being a professor and teaching now for over 47 years consecutively, he also is known for his work uh, in science communication and outreach uh, and policy. Um, he has written four books and appeared in numerous uh, science programming from producers like Nova and the BBC. He did a DVD set of lectures uh, called the Super String Theory, the DNA of Reality uh, with the Teaching Company in, 20, uh, in 2006. Um, and he's even appeared in commercials for Verizon and TurboTax. <laughs> <laughs> More broadly, he has been a member of the Maryland State Board of Education. He has served uh, on former President Barack Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And in 2013, he was awarded a Mendel Medal by Villanova University and awarded by President Barack Obama the National Medal of Science, which is the highest uh, award given to scientists by the US. Uh, in addition to um, that work, let me share with you all an anecdotes, a couple of anecdotes. I think a lot of his success is due to <laughs> several qualities he has, including his creativity, his ability to break down a complex subject, and his ability to tell narratives. Many of you may not know, but he's an avid science fiction fan uh, and loves storytelling. As a child, he often made up stories that were riveting and epic and fantastical for my brother and I uh, as bedtime stories. And as a child, I remember seeing tons of papers with equations that looked like indecipherable scribbles around the house and asking him, what do those say, knowing they told him a story? And instead of saying, I can't tell you, he would say, I can't tell you everything, but I'll try. And then he'd endeavor uh, to earnestly tell a grade school child about subatomic particles, super space symmetries, and gravity. <laughs> so I'm so happy that you all have joined us tonight um, to hear my father tell us about his latest narrative that he's decided to share with us with the help of his co-author, Kathy Pelletier. Please help me in welcoming my father, Jim Gates. So if I may uh, comment, first of all, uh, Kathy asked me to convey her apologies for not being able to be here with us tonight. She really wanted to, uh, but uh, life throws curveballs at us sometimes, and so she couldn't make it. She had a very odd curveball. We won't go into the details about it, but it prevented her from coming down from uh, northern Maine. She lives within walking distance of the Canadian border, so it's quite a distance from here. So uh, with that out of the way, uh, let me also thank you all for coming. Uh, when I, a few moments ago, I walked out to get mic'd up, and as I went through the door, there was a chill that went over me, and I thought to myself, how am I going to react if there's nobody in the audience? <laughs> but then I stopped for a second, and then a second chill ran over me, because I thought to myself, what, how am I going to act if the audience, if this audience is full? So uh, thank you for coming. And this is sort of like the right number of people. You're not sitting on top of each other, so you should be comfortable. And I hope that you'll enjoy uh, our proceedings. So do you want to start with a re reading or a question? Um, so I would like to start with a reading. But first, let me say, so this is nonfiction. Yes. Story, but in a lot of ways, it reads like a novel. And um, so if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing with us an expert that uh, illustrates kind of the prose used in this book. OK. So uh, first of all, I have to tell you, uh, any of you who have children, um, if you're going to write a book and you want to force them to read it, uh, have a book signing here in this series. <laughs> and that way, they will be forced to read your book. <laughs> Because I was shocked when she told me she had actually read it. So let me, first of all, before I do the reading, let me just talk a little bit about the book. Uh, let me first actually say something about why I wrote it, because I think that's actually more important. So uh, as my daughter mentioned in the introduction, uh, I have been teaching for 47 consecutive years. Uh, I started teaching in 1972, and I've taught every consecutive year since then. I love teaching. Uh, it's something that to this very day is just, for me, uh, something magical. Uh, you can figuratively lift the hood off the top of people's heads and see what those engines inside are actually doing. And that's what I discovered in 1972 about teaching. 
So this book is partly for my students. I have been wanting for a long time to write a book where for young people who are getting into STEM disciplines, they would be able to read about the real stories of the people that went before them. Because as they learn these subjects, it seems as though they're some sort of alien giants must have come to Earth and left these legacies that we call science and mathematics and engineering. And so I wanted to write a book where the reader could get to know these people who went before them. And so to me, that was an extraordinarily important thing to do. The other thing, the reason I wrote the book is because I, for the same reasons, I want the public to have an inside view of what a scientist's life is like. And so this book is a big reveal in some sense. Uh, we know that Albert Einstein is the most famous physicist ever. But most people don't really know about his life. So we wanted to tell a story. Now, because I respect the power of narrative, uh, and also because um, physicists are barely civilized, I knew that the story I wanted to tell was not something I could do by myself. And so uh, Kathy and I um, started this project three and a half years ago. It started because of that TurboTax commercial that my daughter mentioned. Kathy saw it one night and sent me email the next day. And uh, so the reason for this whole thing, as I said, is to, to, is to inspire people, both scientists and non-scientists. So let me also start by telling you it's not about Einstein, in the, uh, contrary to the title that you may have read. It's really about eight different people. And those people are William Wallace Campbell, an astronomer who was an extraordinary gentleman, went on to become the president of Berkeley, California, back in the, uh, in the early 1900s, and is responsible for a lot of Berkeley's prominence now. Uh, Charles Dillon Perrine, who was an American but spent most of his career uh, in uh, Argentina uh, trying to build a national telescope facility. Sir Stanley, Arthur Stanley Eddington, who you've probably heard about because he's a prominent figure, uh, Frank Watson Dyson. Frank Watson was Eddington's godfather. Without, Wa uh, without uh, Dyson, Watson probably would have been thrown into jail during the First World War, and so we get into that issue. Charles uh, Rundle Davidson, who was uh, one of the people important on the Eddington expeditions. Andre Cromlin, another such person. Uh, Edvine Finley Freundlich the first astronomer who took Einstein seriously. And in the book, we tell the story about their relationship. And then finally, uh, Edwin Turner Cottingham, who was a clockmaker by profession. But if you know something about astronomy, you know that keeping time is an extraordinarily important exercise for astronomers because what time it is depends on what you can see out there. And so the careful measurement of time is uh, something that astronomers have long worried about. So. With that preamble, I'm going to read for you our prologue, a piece of our prologue, and then we'll probably break. Because, um, as I said, I, I want to pay tribute to my co-author who wasn't here tonight, isn't able to be with us. She is an incredible writer. Uh, she taught me one very important thing uh, as we were writing this book for three and a half years, and that is that I would never be a writer. <laughs> you are, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> prologue. In search, I must search the stars for what is denied me on earth, Albert Einstein. You are standing in the path of totality, waiting for a total eclipse of the sun. You have never witnessed one before, but each is different. It happens slowly, as if giving your brain time to prepare as the shadow of the new moon speeds forward to devour our closest star. At first contact, it looks as if a dark mouth has taken a bite of yellow from the sun, but this is still your world, the one you have known all your life. The bite grows larger as more of the sun disappears. With 10 minutes to second contact, the total eclipse, daylight has gradually slipped away, replaced by a bluish twilight. The once magnificent sun has been eaten down to a thin crescent. Familiar landmarks now exist in a world of monochrome color you do not recognize. Odder things begin to happen. Reflected through the leaves of the nearby trees, thousands of small images of the sun's crescents are spilled on the ground around you. 
Animals have sensed the loss of daylight. Birds flutter in confusion. Cows herd into the barn. Nighttime insects rattle in surprise. Diurnal flowers fold their petals. A shivering dampness flows over you. At your feet, the grass has turned to silver. This is no longer the earth you know. Now the sun becomes a thin sickle, clinging to its last rays of light. The moon's shadow comes quickly from the western horizon, a massive wall of darkness traveling towards you at over 2,000 miles per hour. With totality soon to begin, the crescent of the sun breaks into blazing beads of light that flow into each other like drops of water fusing until only one bead is left. It glitters in the darkened sky above you like a diamond ring. Jets of red flame burst from behind the black body of the moon before it finally covers the sun, the source of life for your planet. Songbirds are silent. Bats are on the wing. This is when you can look with your unprotected eyes at the spectacle above you. Planets that were lost in the light of daylight are now visible. The brightest stars twinkle. The solar corona, shimmering like a milky halo around the sun's hidden disk, is the color of liquid pearls. Its gray light streamers, laced with crimson, are spilling backwards into space for millions of miles. Your world has been thrown into a dream-like trance. Distance now has no meaning. The heavens reach down, bringing the universe closer. The vastness of space reminds you of your mortality. That poem to an eclipse is the, kick, is the result of a few comments from an uncivilized scientist to a massively talented writer. And we wanted the entire book to have that feeling. And so Kathy and I functioned as a conjoined brain. It's the best of collaboration. Namely, I was there to get the science right, to get the mathematics right, but also to get the feel of the life of a scientist. I have lived that life for over 40 years. Kathy's job was to make sure that it all came through a form that was beautifully lyrical and poetic and accessible to a reader. And so we've been told that the book reads like a novel. That's exactly what you want. This is not your usual book about science. So if I may, on that point about how it reads like a novel, in order to do that, it seems that you guys have had to really capture these scientists and their lives and the people around them, as well as the environment. And as far as reading the book, I noticed that there are a lot of annotations at the back with more detail. What did it take to compile such details, to okay. learn about who these people were? So the book, as I said, it was a three and a half year long project. And what it took was a small army of people around the world to actually get it right. Although we were committed to have a work of, that was lyrical and poet, poetic, we also were committed to a, a book that was grounded in the reality and accuracies of both truth and science. So how do you do that? Well, with regard to the f characters whose names I read uh, off to you a few moments ago, what we did was reach out to their families. So we had access to private family documents that told the stories from inside of the heads of what the principal characters were writing back to their family members back home, sometimes thousands of miles away, with letters that might not be, met, might not be seen for weeks. And so that was one source, was actual personal papers of the, of the descendants of our main characters. We also talked to people in libraries and museums around the world to make sure that we got it right. So it wasn't just about proving Einstein right, it's about proving that we could, could get it right in telling the story. So you mentioned the eclipse. What does an eclipse have to do with proving Einstein right? Let me ask this in two pieces. First, can you tell us a little bit about what the theory Einstein had proposed, general relativity, that we've come to accept is, and then how one uses a, an eclipse to help uh, describe or you know, um, prove this theory to be accurate. Your mother just walked in. 
<laughs> so uh, it turns out that from our vantage point, we think of Einstein as perhaps the greatest genius ever. But a lot of that is in the rearview mirror. I mean, if you went back and lived with him, you might have a very different view. And that's partly what we did. So, so what did he do? So and everyone in this room probably uh, knows that in this equation uh, called E is equal to C squared. Energy is equal to mass times the speed of light times the speed of light. That equation was written in 1905. And with that equation, uh, he set out a marker that allowed him to become a professor, which was his goal. He wrote th this work while he was in the patent office. It's something, a story that is uh, part of the story that's well known. But the thing that's really interesting is, although he completed this work in 1905, do you think he became a professor in 1906? No. How about 1907? No. Two years after having the greatest year any theoretical physicist has ever had in history, he was still in the patent office. And that only changed when a physicist named Max Planck showed up at his office. Max Planck was Germany's greatest physicist. And he showed up at the patent office one day and went to the head patent examiner and said, I would like to meet Herr Einstein. <laughs> and so he was conveyed to the little cubby where Einstein did his work. And he was shocked to find this young man of 20, of, at that point, 27, 28 years old. And he was stunned because the physics community was assured that whoever this masterful magician was who was telling them about physics must be a mature man, but it was a kid. So in that year of 1907 is actually the beginning of his later work. He actually describes a moment which he called the happiest moment of his life. And what happened in that happy moment? Well, he was still in the patent office, and there was a building adjacent uh, to, the bu uh, to his uh, workplace, and there were workmen on a roof making repairs. And the thought occurred to him that if one of these workers were to fall off the roof, he would not feel his weight. Now, this is something that we all kind of know, but in the hands of a genius, this was a secret to unlocking the universe. Because what it told him was that weight, or mass, which is of effective gravity, was somehow connected to acceleration. Because as you fall, you accelerate. That's the reason you don't feel your weight. And so he mulled this idea over and over again. And so by 1911, he had begun to write a theory of gravity that was consistent with E equals MC squared. But he didn't get it right. Even a genius could get it wrong. And so in 1911, he wrote this theory. He used it to calculate how starlight would be bent by massive objects. So let me talk about, you ask how the eclipse was working. I have, a, I have a demo. Because that's what professors do. So I've got two dimes here. So I'm going to hold it edge on. And I don't know, maybe the people in front of you, uh, in the front of the uh, auditorium can tell that I'm holding one dime. So here's a second dime. Now from the people in back, can you tell the difference between my holding one dime or two dimes? No, okay, so that's part of our demonstration. <laughs> we'll come back to that. So Albert Einstein, in writing his 1911 version of the theory of general relativity, understood that gravity should bend light. Now, how does that work? Well, imagine I had a, a glass of water in here, a clear glass of water. I could hold it up and look at you, and as I moved the glass back and forward, it would appear to me as if you were moving. Perhaps you've done that sort of thing. But what's really going on is that the light traveling from you through the glass to my eye, that's what's actually doing the moving. And so in Einstein's 1911 work, what he predicted was that if you could watch starlight as it passed a, a star, it would appear to move just like this glass by how much? By one dimes at 1.3 miles away. Now, it turns out that Sir Isaac Newton knew this also. And if you actually use Newtonian physics, you can also calculate the bending. And what you find out is it about one dime at 1.3 miles away from you. 
Well, that set off, and uh, earlier I mentioned Irving, uh, Irving Finley Freundlich. So Einstein suddenly had to have astronomers who could measure this moving light as the starlight passed the sun. Because he was, after all, like me. We're pretty useless, actually. We do mathematics, essentially. I like to say theoretical physics is the most useless kind of physicist that there is. And so he was one of us. So he wasn't going to go out and make the measurement. But he needed allies in the astronomer community to make the measurement. And Irving Finley Freundlich, one of our characters in our book, was the first astronomer to take him seriously and start to advocate for uh, the measurement. It goes on, which is really interesting, is that 1911 prediction was wrong. And so, but astronomers were trying, from that period onward to 1922, were avidly trying to measure the bending of starlight. All kinds of things happened. And the best attempt in that period before 1919 occurred in 1914. Now, 1914 was in the middle of the First World War. And there was a, if you, you've bought the book, and so you, in the book you'll find a bunch of maps of tracks of eclipses. And if you look at the 1914 track, you'll find out that it cuts right through Europe. But in 1914, there was something else going on. A terrible something else was going on, the First World War. And so there were actually astronomers who, in the middle of the First World War, were trying to measure whether starlight would be bent by one dime's worth at 1.3 miles or two dime's worth. They, none of them got the measurement through, due to all kinds of uh, circumstances. And that's some of the adventure that we write about in the book is what happened to these people as they were making, they struggling to do this. And so no one made the measurement. But if they had, the prediction that Einstein was making was one dime's worth. The measurement would have come back two dimes worth because nature doesn't cheat. She also is a better calculator than the rest of us. And therefore, Einstein would have been introduced to the world as this sort of bumbling physicist guy who got it wrong. And so he was very fortunate that no one got the measurement done in 1914. But in 1919, uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, uh, leading two different expeditions, one to uh, Principe, an island off the west coast of Africa, another to Brazil, uh, Sobral, Brazil. They made the measurements, and they found, they're the people that told us it was two dimes worth at 1.3 miles. And with that, you folks get a gift. The gift is that Einstein's theory of general relativity is correct or accurate, and it also leads to the Big Bang, and so finally, scientists can understand where everything comes from. So the greatest gift of Einstein is his theory. But for our species, it's that we get to understand how we all got here. It took about 13.8 billion years, transformations of energy, matter, space, and time. And in that entire 13.8 billion years, the universe apparently makes exactly one copy of you. To me, that's a measure of preciousness. And so that's the kind of thing we talk about. So <clears throat> you also, uh, in the beginning, mentioned how uh, these stories are stories of people, um, as, as well as um, having to obtain this information by the different means of talking to people at libraries with archives, as well as family members. And if I remember correctly, you have some interesting details that haven't previously been well known to share. Sure. So. One of the, perhaps one of the most interesting uh, details is about uh, Davidson, who was one of the members. So let me set the stage. Arthur Eddington headed two different expeditions. As I said, one to Principe, a coast off of Africa, and the other to Brazil. And so what happened was uh, they planned for months and months to make these expeditions. And then the four of them, it was Eddington, Cottingham, they were two of a pair. And then uh, uh, Davidson and, um, let's see, what was the other name I called? No, it wasn't Finley. Andre. Yes, Cromlin. Thank you, Andre Cromlin. The two pairs of them split up to two different expeditions and made the measurements. And there were all kinds of adventures around that, and we try to tell the story. 
But Davidson, who was one of the people who was on the expedition that led to us all accepting the theory of general relativity and that big bangs are responsible for our universe, lived into his 90s. And we were told in a communication with his family that when, in 1969, humans landed on the moon, uh, he said he thought it was fake, that it couldn't possibly be true. He also had stories about, so this is 69, when a lot of young women were wearing miniskirts. And so he would say, they forgot to put on all their clothes, didn't they? <laughs> so these are the kinds of human details that you hear about these apparent giants of science. Say again? Because you have to understand, this is someone who was born in the Edwardian age of this world, where uh, that meant that he would have lived through seeing the first uh, heavier-than-air flights by the Wright brothers. He would have lived through seeing uh, the birth of uh, um, telegraph. He would be at the end of the period of the industrial evolution revolution, watching steam power become the predominant source of energy for our species. And so if you've lived through all of that, then maybe you have a, you know, maybe you have a predilection to say, not just everything is possible. And he just absolutely refused to believe it. So that's an interesting uh, point about not just everything being possible or the ability to believe uh, when technology comes so far. Even um, Einstein himself, though he um, originally uh, wrote GR, and it, it describes the Big Bang. At first, when uh. encountered with the idea of this meaning the universe was expanding, uh, was reluctant to accept this. And also he and a lot of his colleagues weren't uh, very familiar or ready to accept or prepared to understand the idea of a black hole. Yes. And they often thought of the fact that general relativity can describe a black hole as just um, a proxy for needing to understand more about matter, but if we understood matter better, we wouldn't actually be able to compress it enough to make a black hole. So I guess I would like to know your opinion on what this means about a cautionary tale for us is how we should think about the impossible, as well as the power of following your nose with the equations as opposed to what feels possible. So one of the things that I, oftentimes I have to speak to the public, or I do, or I'm asked to, and so one of the things that I often tell people is that for a theoretical physicist, mathematics is like having a third eye because we come to trust this ability to use mathematics and model the way the universe works. And we actually trust that in some sense more than our senses. Now, this trust is not just absolutely given away because the only thing that stops theoretical physics from being a faith-based operation is that we also have people who go out and make the measurements on these crazy ideas that come out of our trust of mathematics. So it's a conversation that we're having with Mother Nature. We use mathematics to look deeply into nature. Just like Einstein in 1911, we usually get it wrong. But we have colleagues who go out and take these predictions and offer them to observation. In fact, one of Einstein's sayings, which I really adore, is he said, the life of a theorist is not to be envied. And the reason, he, he then goes on to say, uh, the reason, and I'm paraphrasing, the reason is because when, uh, when you do this work, you have to submit it to observation and experiment. And most oftentimes, Mother Nature is going to return a negative answer. But even when she doesn't, she doesn't give you a yes. What she gives you is a maybe, and that it is an unfortunate fact that for most theories that are offered, she says no almost immediately after the theory is presented. So that's what the life of a theorist is run like. So going on then um, about the life of a theorist being related to talking to experimentalists and having a conversation about what does the data say about how the world works around us, um, I find this interesting in relation to both the title of the book, but a passage you then write towards the end of the book. So um, the book itself, of course, is uh, titled Proving Einstein Right, but um, in the book you, you go on to say that uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity did not triumph as a uh, 
um, as the first write-up in newspapers claimed when uh, the measurements came in from the eclipses. Um, you say, it was not proven right by the results, nor was, uh, nor was Newton proven wrong. It was just that Newton's law of gravity did not describe certain phenomena, like the bending of light. Um, and then you say um, that um, it is not the job of science to prove things. It is instead science is interested in a theory's probability in the face of existing evidence. So uh, can you talk in more detail about why it's not, even though the title of the book is Proving Einstein, why it's not so much proving um, that science does? Sure. So one of the peculiar properties of science, which is not generally understood, is that science really is not about proving things right. It's about proving things wrong. And the reason is, there are a couple of reasons for why science works this way. One of them is the so-called black, black swan theory. So what's the black swan theory? Well, if you'd lived several hundred years ago in Europe uh, and observed swans, you might make the observation that they're all white. You can see them on the Danube, you can see them in the Black Forest, you can see them everywhere, but they're all white. And if you went to a place where you had never been before in Europe looking for swans, those swans would have been white too. So you might conclude that you keep amassing evidence that all swans are white. But it turns out that statement is false. There are, in fact, black swans that are native to Western Australia, and around 1619, uh, a, a, a um, Danish, uh, no, a Dutch explorer actually first saw a black swan. And so what this shows you is that even though you can go around accumulating evidence, that's not a proof of correctness, not an absolute ironclad proof. And because of that, you then, if you take that to its logical extreme, you say, well, that means that no, you know, I could, I could accumulate evidence for centuries, but it's an observation that actually tells me whether I'm, uh, whether I'm telling, describing something accurate or not. So science actually doesn't prove things right. It actually proves things are wrong. For the things it doesn't prove are wrong, it gives them a tentative sort of, I like to call the word science exists in a word, a state of tentativity. And that's one of the deep, dark secrets of science. And it turns out that Einstein's work in general relativity is how scientists themselves came to understand this. In what manner? Can you describe that in more detail? Sure. So I recently gave a talk at the Fordham Law School. And so you might wonder, what's a physicist doing among lawyers? Um, I like to tell people they're not really that different. Um, <laughs> but um, I gave a talk there about forensic science. Because as my daughter mentioned, I've actually, I have a career kind of in public policy, which is kind of weird, but it's true. And so one of the weird things I discovered while we were writing this book was that, was that there's a set of rulings in the Supreme Court and in federal law that are, uh, the last time it came prominently to the fore is maybe some of you remember the uh, case on um, intelligent design in York, Pennsylvania. It was a case where there was a school board that wanted to mandate in classrooms the teaching of des intelligence design as among the scientific theories that um, students ought to learn. Now, of course, the people pushing this really had another agenda. They really wanted the students to learn about the biblical story of creation. And so they had it clothed in this shell of pseudoscience called intelligent design. This school board lost the case. And one of the reasons they lost the case is because the judge ruled that uh, because intelligence design could not be disproved and didn't meet a legal standard called the Daubert standard, uh, that was part of his ruling against the case. So you might wonder where the Daubert standard came from. Well, that turns out to be related to a philosopher. The philosopher's name is Karl Popper. And he was a really interesting guy. He was. Uh, he was a student around the time Einstein was doing his work on general relativity. And he observed that uh, if he, he compared sort of three groups, Marxist, uh, Freudian psychologist, and physicist. And he was looking at their, how they behaved in the face of being confronted by data that actually seems to contradict their fundamental beliefs. And what he concluded was the thing that distinguished physicists is that at the end of the day, it was data 
that they used to say, this is what we will accept as our canon, not a tradition of what had gone before. And so Popper was a philosopher which, who writes about this, and that's how it gets partially into the law. There's a more complicated version. But Popper got this observation by looking at Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein has directly affected the laws of your country by this route. So um, in your t telling and uh, uh, talking about the eclipse, one of the things um, in, in the beautiful prologue you say um, towards the end, if I remember correctly, is how the eclipse changed, uh, the world hasn't changed after the eclipse is over, but you have. Um, have you yourself had any experiences uh, with nature and math uh, and science or such that you feel like gave you a new glimpse and have changed the way you look at things? Wow, I've never been asked that question. Um, my love for science and my wish to become a scientist started when I was four years old. But it wasn't an interaction with nature, it was a dumb science fiction movie. So, you know, that, that's how I mark my beginning. The most powerful experience the most powerful experience I had was in high school. I was uh, in 11th grade, and my teacher uh, showed an experiment where you, you take a board and you tilt it and you roll a ball down the experiment, and you have hash marks on the front of the board, and then you have students call off, uh, have stopwatches, and then they call off the time as the ball passes the hash marks. And so my student, my teacher went through this uh, demonstration. And I remember he wrote down the results. And he, she showed me that the motion of the ball was in agreement with a mathematical equation. Uh, the distance traveled goes as the square of the time that you wait on your stopwatch. I was stunned by that experience. In fact, I tell people, that's the closest thing to magic I have ever seen in my now almost 69 years of life. So that event was a signal event of watching the, uh, watching the convolution of nature, mathematics, and the way human minds work. So you've described throughout um, our talk um, some of the things the different scientists had to go through, the making of this measurement, the uh, war breaking out while they were trying to measure the eclipse, um, and how it's a very human story. So, and you mentioned in the beginning that you wrote for two audiences, the public and your students. So if you had to distill the lessons for each of these two groups, the public and your students that you want them to take away, what would you say are the lessons you're hoping they'll glean? So um, let me talk a little bit about my background. You, you, you introduced it. I, I was a student. At, I came to MIT in 1969 with a desire to become a physicist. Um, I spent four years there, and anticipating you would be my daughter, I, I got two degrees also, <laughs> one in math and one in physics. I didn't want to be outdone by her uh, in the future. Uh, working on the PhD, so you know. Yeah, maybe okay, so yeah, so yeah, maybe so, we'll <laughs> see. Um, and then uh, I stayed four more years and got my PhD. And so during that time, I remember many, many occasions when I felt, how in the world can I, can I live up to the standards of a, of a Maxwell or Einstein and Newton? I, I, you know, it's like, unless you're extraordinarily arrogant, <laughs> you find yourself lacking. At least it's easy to feel like, I'm not worthy, I'm not capable, uh, I can't do this thing. And so for me, uh, the, when I finally, now from my 68th year of life and over 40 years of science, look back at it, I think how much I would have liked to have had a senior person that I trust come back and tell me that you can do this too, that this is your birthright to do this. This is what humans do if you let them realize their dreams and if their dreams are about science. They do great science. They have the capacity to do great science. And there's nothing that separates you from that. And so for me, that, that's the real deepest takeaway that I want young people to take from this book. And that's why it's not about the science. It's about the scientist. Wonderful. So 
Uh, there are about 10 minutes uh, left. Um, why don't we open up for some audience questions? Boy, you should have done an easier transition on that one. You've, oh, I scared him. <laughs> yeah. You've got people sprinting around the hall, which is dangerous. <laughs> I apologize. Oh. Uh, a quick thought uh, question would be, what's the next chapter of physics? Oh. Einstein did his chapter, and now who's on the horizon? So I can't answer who, but I can answer what. So um, you've probably all heard of string theory, but it doesn't exist, actually. Uh, is what we call string theory now is an incredibly large collection of mutually reinforcing facts, but that doesn't make it a theory. And when you have a theory, you actually also have an overarching paradigm which explains those facts, and we have no such explanation with string theory. Uh, quantum mechanics is the thing that I tell people, look at the history of quantum mechanics and how that became a theory, and then compare that to what we call string theory, and you'll be able to, to discern this problem that I'm talking about. So what I think is on the horizon is something really interesting and strange. And uh, I was partly motivated by my own research, but partly by the research of many other people who work on this edge. It involves something called information theory. Information theory, the kind of mathematical structure that tells you how computer science works and how digital information is transformed. Um, a number of us have found very strange hints that information theory structures sit inside of the equations that are like string theory, or in my case, supersymmetry, and so I've really begun to think, and in fact, for a decade or so, I thought information theory is really going to be the next big thing in fundamental physics. The other thing that may or may not play a role, because, and now this is strictly because of my work, in my work, we see these information theory structures, but the structures are error correcting codes, which are very bizarre. It leads a lot of people to claim that I think we live in the world of the matrix for real. I don't think that at all. Uh, there are, in addition to the matrix, in nature, there's one place where I see uh, error correcting codes. It's in genetics. This has been a debate in genetic, the genetics for a couple of decades. And so and you can ask in this part of natural science, what are these error correcting codes doing and why are they there? And uh, people who are geneticists will tell you that they're there because they give an evolutionary advantage to the genomes that possess them. This leads me to suspect that if this thing we call supersymmetry, which is what I work on, uh, and also I want to point out someone behind you there, Barton Zwiebach, who was uh, the first PhD thesis I supervised when I was at Caltech. But if we're right about this thing we call supersymmetry, and it has these error correcting codes in it, then I, I think that raises the stakes that somehow something like evolution acted on the mathematical laws of our universe, a really bizarre idea. So I think it's some combination there, which is the next thing that's going to happen. Hello. Um, I had a question about whether you had a uh, spoiler alert uh, that you were trying to um, save us from. But um, in 1911, you say that uh, Einstein was wrong. And in 1919, he was proved right. What, was, what happened in the middle? Well, because he changed his mind. You see, uh, in 1915, he actually figured out the right set of equations to use to make these predictions about the bending of starlight. In fact, he made three different predictions uh, from these set of equations. The first one was about the way Mercury orbits the sun. It had been known prior to Einstein for at least 50 years that somehow Mercury did not orbit the sun in the way that Newton thought it should. And in fact, astronomers invented a solution they said there must be a planet out there called Vulcan that is very close to the sun and that it's the reason why Mercury's orbit is strange. Well, there is no Vulcan except in Star Trek. <laughs> so that was one of the predictions. The second prediction was, let me go to the third prediction and come back to the second. The third prediction was on what we call the gravitational red shift. It, it's, a, it's, all, it's a Doppler effect. You know, if you're standing next to a train track and a train is coming to you, and you're standing really close, but not on the tracks, hopefully, um, you will hear a characteristic shift in frequency. It will be something like, uh, 
right? You'll hear this drop in pitch. That's called the Doppler effect. It also affects light, and there was a prediction in general relativity about that. It turns out that prediction actually wasn't settled until the 60s. It's really a very long story, long after we did the book, but we're aware of how it evolved. But the second prediction was this uh, bending starlight prediction. He got a different set of equations, and that, on the basis of those second equations, that's what Eddington and company found the evidence that nature says you're not wrong. I'm um, curious, uh, have you seen an eclipse? Uh, or I've seen only partial eclipses. I've never been to a, uh, a location of a total eclipse. I highly recommend it. And if you go, only take one camera. Don't set up four like I did. <laughs> but uh, can you talk a little bit more about the actual experiment? That sure. That both groups used to... Uh, Sure. So uh, they used the most sensitive telescopes that were available at the time, because I've told you what was the level of uh, discernment that they needed in order to make the measurement. Was it one dime at a mile there or two dimes at a mile there that the shifting starlight moved? So they uh, took a 14-inch uh, uh, telescope, and they also took 8-inch telescopes with them, but not each of the Eddington expeditions were equivalently equipped. And in particular, one of the problems that you may have heard about over the years is the, uh, they took photographic plates, the old fashioned photographic plates. And these photographic plates were subject to uh, warping due to the temperatures and because both of these places they went to were tropical places. And so one of the things that people for years have had a disagreement about is whether Eddington might have uh, fudged the data. But in my mind, having read uh, the accounts as well as I could, what I claim is that Eddington did what every great scientist does. If you talk to so experimental scientists and observationalists, every single one of them that I've ever interacted with has an intuition about when you're getting good data. And that to me is, as I read his story, he simply exercised the experience that any great experimentalist or observationalist would have done. Thank you for asking, Shmuel. Um, so, yes, and in fact, that someone is one of the characters in our book. It's William Wallace Campbell, an American astronomer who drove the development of astronomy in the United States. He, as I said, went on to become the president of uh, the University of California, Berkeley. Much of the greatness of Berkeley be, was built on a foundation during his tenure as president. He also be, uh, was the leader of, uh, so there is a Pacific Astronomical Society in the United States that in the early, six, uh, early 1900s came to great prominence. It was under his guidance that all that happened. He also became a president of the uh, National Academy of Sciences. He was a truly incredible individual. And in fact, he is to my, after writing this story, he is my personal hero in this. And in 1922, on an expedition to Western Australia, he's the one who nailed down the measurements about the bending starlight, of whether it was one dime or two. What was, uh, was oh. Einstein made, a, made the, the money? Yes. On the math, and then it was verified. How close did he come? How close did who come? Oh, uh, well, that's the, uh, thank you, yeah, yeah. So that's the other thing that you need to understand about science is that we, we well, I'll tell you a story and then I'll try to respond. Uh, I'm a theoretical physicist, uh, and there's a very famous story about theoretical physicists. Uh, it involves the cosmic microwave background. So this is a kind of astronomical signal that we can see in the microwave. And the story basically goes that um, a measurement was made in the 1960s and they, uh, Arno, Pen, Arno Penzias and Bob Wilson made this measurement of these microwave signals coming down from the sky. And one way to describe these signals was that they had, in terms of their energy content, because for a physicist, energy and temperature are related by a constant called the uh, Boltzmann constant. One way to describe this radiation was a three degree radiation, which was the name that it had when I was a kid. No one knew what, where this was coming from, except that this was at Bell Labs, close to Princeton. And there was a, uh, there was a cosmologist, a theoretical cosmologist there named Robert Dickey. 
And he had done some calculations which started with the assumption that there was a Big Bang, and he had figured out that there should be a residual sort of energy everywhere in the universe. He got a number of, of about five degrees above absolute zero. So when this measurement came in at three degrees, we theorists declared victory. Because that's the way we work. You see, we understand, those of us who are theorists, we understand that we don't nail the numbers. Because in fact, science is always about, as she mentioned, about the probabilities and how close you are to being correct. And so to answer your question, the as I recall, the numbers that Eddington measured were like something, they're less than 10% off of the matter, off the modern measured values. So he came really good, close. Hi. Oh, gosh, this is a lot yep. more sensitive than I thought it was. Uh, yeah, I remember reading about that, and there was a history of how they were convinced that their instruments were faulty or something like that. That's and right. they were just like, where is this noise coming from? Uh, but my question to you was that, this book is dedicated to the various searching expeditions to prove particular theorems and, and um, models of accuracy. Uh, and it was, you have people like Michelson Morley and so on, and it, it was uh, Cavendish experiments, and it's like small expeditions. I, I, I want to put air quotes around that smallness because you know someone had to travel halfway around the world to be in the right place at the right time. But nowadays for the kind of expeditions that you need to do, you need to build particle colliders the size of Switzerland, right? So do you expect that that age is over? Do you, do you think that the, the character of, of this discovery process is going to be different in this century? That's a very interesting question. And as a, someone who's a... So I don't do experiments. I, I tell people, if you let me into your laboratory, I'll break your experimental equipment faster than the speed of light. <laughs> so I personally do not have the capacity to carry out high-grade observations and experiments. But I am hopeful that we will see a kind of technological breakthrough, especially in my, my love particle physics, because the problem that we see in particle physics, as you mentioned, the large colliders like the like the uh, LHC or, or the thing that we never built in the United States called the SSC. These are tremendously large and expensive devices. And so it would be nice to have a new technology for doing particle physics. And for over two decades, people have talked about a new technology called wake field acceleration, for example. Or uh, people have, uh, uh, and you know, they've used uh, highly intense lasers to try to develop this new kind of technology. I'm st hopeful that something like that, a breakthrough like that, will occur because that's what we need to and continue to explore down to smaller and smaller realms. Uh, going in the other direction, uh, it's possible that uh, with things like the cosmic microwave background, and especially with a gravitational wave physics. There are, although the, the, way, the generation of gravity wave detectors that we have now are large devices that are over a mile on each side, uh, there are proposals for using superconducting quantum uh, interference devices, squids, in order to make those kinds of measurements in a different range of frequency, but still, these, these are tabletop experiments that people are talking about. So maybe in some parts of science, our technology will in fact allow us to get away from these sort of multi-billion dollar experiments. And there's a lot of science right now that doesn't take multi-billion dollar experiments. So it'll, it'll be uh, very interesting and I probably won't be around to see most of it. And I think we have time for about one more question before we move over to the reception in Cabot Library. Um, hi. Um, what I, I was on the centenary celebration there on Sobral of the eclipse that happened there. And what they, they one, about, one of the lectures was about the data that they collected, like both in Prince Island and in Sobral. And in the end, they said that although both places had a 14-inch telescope each. The data that they uh, ended up using on the article was the one collected on the 8-inch telescope, that it was the, like the secondary telescope. That's correct. Now. I would like to know, like, 
what exactly happened with the data on the two main telescopes and why it, they ended it was up? The, it was the photographic plates that were the problem, that they both, so on both of the 18-inch telescopes, the data was taken on, taken on full of photographic plates and the ability, the accuracy of the images that you would have to get would depend on your maintaining a, a relatively constant temperature across the surface of the plates so that they don't warp. And that condition was not met for either of those sets of plates. And that's why it's the backup telescope that provided the best numbers. And we know they're the best now because when you compare them to what Campbell got, did in 1922, they agree remarkably well with the measurements of Campbell. That's, thank you. All right, one last round of applause for our speakers tonight. <laughs>